And to our panelists, we're now live. Welcome everyone. We'll just wait a few minutes while people get in and get settled and get on their technology. Uh, as we wait, please feel free to enter your name and a land acknowledgement from the territory that you are joining us from in the chat. And just a, uh, another announcement to those who are just joining us. We're going to wait a few more minutes while people get in and get settled. Uh, if you would like, please feel free to introduce yourself and to offer a land acknowledgement from the territory that you are joining us from in the chat menu. We'll just wait another two or three minutes to get started as people get in and get settled. Uh, it's lunchtime in central Canada and just at the end of lunch uh, in eastern Canada. So we'll wait a few more minutes here. And to those who are just joining, we're going to wait another couple of minutes while people get in and get settled. Uh, and if you'd like, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat menu and to offer a land acknowledgement if you wish. All right, I think we'll get started. We'll get through some of the housekeeping uh, content at the beginning here. So hello everyone and welcome to the second KEGS virtual symposia. My name is Ian Worley and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies, l'Association Canadienne pour les études supérieures. On behalf of the KEGS board of directors, we are delighted that you have joined us here today. We hope that this week long series of webinars will serve to inform, connect and inspire you during this unprecedented moment in the history of higher education. The events planned this week will address a variety of challenges, opportunities and inflection points in graduate studies, including student empowerment, the use of digital tools and technologies, strategies for collecting, preserving and sharing data, equitable inclusion and the struggle against anti black racism. Discussions on these topics will be led by a diverse group of presenters from across Canada, including deans of graduate studies, faculty members, administrators, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and early career researchers. The goal of this virtual event is to provide a forum for sharing information and experiences, posing questions, and building strategies for adapting to our new environment. Before we begin today's session, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. First, and perhaps most importantly, this session includes a simultaneous remote transcription service, which you can access through the link provided in the chat menu. A new window will open on your internet browser and translated text should begin streaming automatically. Secondly, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A tool located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you would like to pose a question verbally, let us know and we can offer you the virtual mic. If you would like to converse with other attendees throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat menu at your leisure. Next, we highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right hand side of the window. You'll have two options, speaker view and gallery view. We do recommend speaker view. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CAG's YouTube page in a few weeks. 
It is also essential that we recognize and acknowledge that this symposia is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Kegs and those gathered here today honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their past valuable and present contributions to this land. I would now like to introduce our first webinar of the week, Research Data Management or RDM, the ins and outs for grad students, postdocs and early career researchers. RDM is increasingly recognized as a key part of the research enterprise in all disciplines. With the recent release of the tri-agency policy on research data management, both researchers and the institutions and people who support them will soon need to implement RDM best practices in their work. This webinar introduces graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and other early career researchers to the fundamentals of both the tri-agency policy and RDM more broadly as it applies to their own research. This event will be hosted by Jennifer Abel, the training coordinator at the Portage Network, NDRIO. I will let Jen explain that acronym to you later. Jennifer works with Portage's network of experts to develop and deliver research data management training to students, researchers, librarians, data professionals, and other stakeholders across Canada. She previously worked with Portage as the project officer, supporting data management planning, sensitive data, and research intelligence. Prior to joining Portage, she worked at the University of British Columbia's Education Library and in the Research Commons, where she helped develop a research data management workshop. She has taught at the University of Calgary, Mount Royal College, and UBC. I now pass the virtual mic over to you, Jen. Thank you very much, Ian. I listening to that. It sounds like I've done a lot of stuff in my life. I didn't know, <laughs> but there you go. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that the land that I'm speaking to you from is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And as Ian mentioned, I am uh, part of the Portage Network, which is also part of the new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, or ENDRIO. Um, and Portage is a network of over 140 experts from 60 institutions across Canada. And if those numbers are not currently up to date, I know Jeff will up to date them later. We have experts from academic libraries, the tri-agencies, institutional research offices, and beyond. We collaborate with a broad range of stakeholders and partners locally, nationally, and internationally to build capacity and develop services and infrastructure so that all academic researchers in Canada, including grad students, have access to the support they need for research data management. And as Ian mentioned, that's what we're gonna be talking about today, research data management, or RDM. You'll hear that acronym a lot. We're going to start today by talking about the tri agencies recently released RDM policy. And to do that, we have with us today Dr. Matthew Lucas, who is the Executive Director of Corporate Strategy and Performance for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC. He has a background in the area of science, technology, and innovation policy. Prior to SHRC, he worked at Industry Canada, where he held different positions, including Senior Policy Advisor to the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council Secretariat and the Departmental Advisor to the Minister of State, State for Science and Technology. Matthew has been a leader in the development of this RDM policy and has worked closely with Portage over the years, and I can't think of anyone better to speak about this subject today. So Matthew, the digital pixelated floor is now yours. <laughs> thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, uh, Ian, uh, for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm joining you from Ottawa, which, as Ian mentioned, is the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, je voudrais aussi en avance que j'ai partagé la présentation en, en anglais et en français. Et bien que je présente en anglais aujourd'hui, n'hésitez pas à poser des questions dans l'une ou l'autre des langues officielles. I will just share my screen now. And please let me know, thumbs up. I can see Jeff. Thumbs up, Jeff, if you can see that screen. Perfect. Um, I'm particularly happy to, to be here today because as we've been talking about research data management over the past number of years, uh, one of the uh, topics that keeps coming up is the importance of culture change. 
And of course, at the heart of, of culture change are students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, emerging researchers. So uh, as I go through this presentation and, and as we begin to implement this policy, I wanna start just by saying we really would welcome your feedback on how we at the agencies can support graduate students in, in developing a better understanding of data management and implementing some aspects of data management into their lives. I, I'm also really pleased because unless things have changed since I was a graduate student, Many of you will be the ones tasked with preparing the data management plans for your uh, for your supervisors and for the projects you'll be working on. So uh, again, I, I I welcome any questions you have about about uh, how that will be implemented. We've been working on at the at the agencies on policy development around data management for a number of years, stretching back to 2013. Some examples here of work we've done. Uh, I'll admit the, the development of this, this policy which I'll be speaking about has taken us a little longer than hoped. Um, we've had a few changes, changes in government, changes in leadership at the agencies. And then of course, just when we were prepared to launch this policy um, uh, last year, uh, uh, COVID hit. So we were delayed by a year in the launch, but we're really pleased to have finally been able to launch it in March of, uh, of this year. And just very quickly, the policy has three components to it. One, an, a requirement around institutional strategies, and that is a requirement that post-secondary institutions and research hospitals that manage or administer uh, tri-agency funding, so funding from CIHR, MSERC, or SURE, they're required to create an institutional strategy around how they support research data management and make that strategy public. The second requirement is for data management plans that for certain funding opportunities, the agencies will require data management plans to be submitted uh, with their app with applications and i'll be speaking a bit more about that in a moment. And finally, a requirement around data deposit that uh, data linked to the final research outputs of research grants will be required to be deposited in uh, in data uh, rep repositories. The implementation timeline for each of these requirements is, uh, is uh, varies, and I'll, I'll speak about that in a moment. But first, I'd just like to say a couple of words about uh, the, the development of this policy. We, we had quite extensive consultations. Uh, Jeff Moon, who's on this call, was a part of a number of those in-person engagements. We had a bit of a, a cross-country tour at one point. Uh, I can't remember the number of presentations we gave, but we had stopped all across the country presenting um, to universities. Uh, uh, around our thoughts around data management and getting feedback. And we had an online consultation, which was quite well, um, uh, we quite a good response to 130 submissions. And you see here the variety of submissions uh, we received from that, that consultation. And a lot of very helpful feedback that helped us revise the draft policy into the policy we, uh, we now have. The feedback we received from that consultation was not surprising. First, some clarifications were required. There was a bit of uncertainty as to whether this was an open data policy versus a data managed policy. So we've clarified that this is not an open data policy. This policy does not require you to make your data open. It is a policy that requires that your data be managed and encourages you to make it open whenever possible, but recognizes there's a number, there are a number of reasons why one might not be able to do that. Um, understandable costs, concerns around cost and capac uh, capacity to manage data effectively, questions about how the agencies would monitor compliance, concerns over the implementation timelines, and then some real concerns over Indigenous data sovereignty. I'll say there were also some questions as to whether the requirements of this policy would be placed on grant holders, uh, scholarship holders, and fellowship holders. And I'll say uh, that no, the requirements of this policy um, are primarily focused on, on grant holders and not scholarship holders or fellowship holders, although we do encourage uh, the effective management of data by all researchers across the full, full spectrum. So happy to talk a bit more about that as we go through this. The, um, there was a real uh, question around the policy, how the policy impacted Indigenous research. And we did further consultations with Indigenous communities, both First Nations, Inuit, and Métis to understand, get their feedback and understand their perspective on, on data management. So if you look at the policy now, you'll see there are a number of sections that speak to the importance of managing data that is uh, uh, related to research by and with Indigenous communities in accordance with the principles developed by and accepted by those, uh, those communities. You may have noticed 
in the recent budget announcement, the federal budget announcement, some new funding was given both to First Nations, Métis and Inuit to further develop uh, data management and data governance principles. So we very much look forward to working with those, those groups to uh, better understand how they see data management within their, their particular, particular context. Um, and so you'll also note that for each of the three requirements that I've mentioned, there's explicit language that states, uh, again, for research by and with Indigenous communities, that for the principles by which one uh, um, thinks about data management strategies, develops data management plans, and, 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 and thinks about data deposits have to be in line with the principles that those communities develop and approve. Now, looking at the implementation timeline, we'd always intended to have a, a gradual implementation timeline for this, but in the context of COVID, in the context of a number of challenges that post-secondary institutions are facing, we, we pushed back our timelines a little bit. We'd initially been thinking that maybe one year after the policy launch, we would require that institutional strategies come online. We've now extended that to two years, giving institutions a bit more time. We know some have already developed strategies. We know some are in the process of developing strategies. And we think, but we think this extra time will also help us to uh, work with different stakeholders in the communities to help those institutions that may not have been thinking about this yet, or may have a more difficult time, uh, or may need to rely on the services offered by other institutions to ensure that their researchers and students have the full range of data management supports uh, that they need. In terms of data management plans, the, the policy states that by the spring of 2022, so in, in about a year, the agencies will be identifying an initial set of funding opportunities subject to DMP requirements. Now we already have some funding opportunities. Uh, you may have noticed some of the NFREF, uh, that's the new uh, Frontiers and Research Fund, for agency fund have some data management plan requirements. Um, at SHRC, we, um, have some requirements around some of our programs as well, but we'll be looking to extend those uh, in the spring of 2022. Uh, and what that means is that when um, researchers apply for funding, for project funding, they will be required to submit a DMP or a data management plan as part of their application. And that that data management plan will be considered by the uh, peer or merit review committee. Which is not yet clear uh, how much weight or how the committee will uh, review those within the broader context of their research adjudication. We expect in the first year um, it will be a learning experience for the, the committees and we won't be waiting it in, in the funding decision, but we expect moving forward it would be a part of that decision. And, and honestly, we expect as a, as a stronger culture of data management just becomes a part of good research, that data management will simply be viewed as a part of methodology. How you manage your data is, is a crucial part of how you do your research and it will be viewed and adjudicated as such. And finally, the data deposit requirement. This is the requirement that, that raises most concerns when it comes to cost and capacity. Uh, and so we haven't set a timeline for when that requirement will come in yet. We're gonna be working further with um, stakeholders in the community, particularly uh, Portage and Endrio and others to understand when uh, a, a realistic timeline for that will come into effect. And those of you that have been working with, uh, with Jeff and Portage know there's a lot of work going on right now to ensure that the data deposit capacity is there for researchers. Um, and we certainly won't be prescribing any one size fits all uh, approach to this. We recognize there are disciplinary differences that need to be taken into account. There are um, a number of, 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 of challenges, in addition to a number of reasons why one might not be able to deposit data in certain ways. So we wanna re uh, uh, maintain flexibility, recognizing, recognizing these differences, but wanna ensure that researchers are thinking about, about that. And again, there would not be a requirement that researchers share their data, but we would be, we are highly encouraging that. You'll see that in the policy. Um, uh, and part of that growing openness to sharing data is part of the culture change I, I mentioned at the beginning. And we, we very much welcome thoughts that, that you have on how you can be a part of, of, uh, of that culture change. In terms of supporting um, implementation, we've said all along that, that, that the launch of the policy is just the first step in our ongoing engagement with, uh, with stakeholders. Um, we plan to be here um, facilitating conversations, uh, helping uh, support you know, webinars, workshops and the like, 
um, to, uh, to ensure that people have the tools and the opportunities to, to engage on what effective data management means, either from a disciplinary point of view, a stage of career point of view, an institutional point of view. There's a lots of ways of slicing this. Um, and so we're, we want to be working with key stakeholders in the community like Portage, uh, like Research Data Canada, uh, like Endrio, which those are going to become a part of, um, to, to fully support this. So at CHIRC, we've, we've had for the, uh, a couple of years now some research data management capacity building initiatives through our connection grants that some have taken, uh, taken um, um, advantage of. And we have a couple more sessions of that, and then we'll be reevaluating re that and perhaps extending it. CIHR has some, a learning module on research data management. And of course, there are a number of tools that Portage uh, has developed an ongoing work that they are involved in to help institutions and researchers and students um, ensure they're well equipped to manage their data. And, and finally, as I, I wrap up, there's a number of complementary initiatives. As I, I mentioned earlier, this is a very a quickly evolving space. The, it's the new digital research infrastructure organization. I suppose that at some point we'll have to drop the new. Conveniently, perhaps new could become national and the acronym could stay. Um, but as, as, that, as that group moves into this space and, and research data management is one of the three pillars that that group will be taking charge of, um, uh, we, will, we look forward to working much more closely with, with it. Uh, you may also be aware the Chief Science Advisor has launched a roadmap for open science and, and expects to be launching some consultations on open science uh, this fall. Um, and we will be continuing to work um, to implement the tri-agency strategy around strengthening Indigenous research capacity. And, and as I mentioned before, working with the key stakeholders within Indigenous communities to um, empower them to develop the data management uh, policies, principles that uh, that um, that they would then use to uh, ma help manage their relationships with uh, with with the broader research uh, research community. And with all of that said, again, I would just reiterate: I really welcome any feedback now or in the future, uh, either from CAGS or any of you individually, around how the agencies can support uh, the, your data management needs and can help you be a part of that culture change that uh, that I've spoken of. And uh, with that, it's thank you again for the opportunity to speak. And I would like to hand the floor back to Jennifer. Great, thank you so much, Matthew, th for that whirlwind tour through the policy. Um, I have put the links into the chat for the policy online if you'd like to go and have a look. Maybe not now, maybe oh. after the webinar, um, but it's definitely worth having a read through to see what all the nuances are, um, as I've done a few times. And now to talk about how you can go about implementing uh, the policy in your work, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Moon, who is my boss at the Portage Network. Uh, he's been the director of Portage for four years and it has overseen and is in the process of overseeing our transition from the Canadian Association of Research Libraries to Andrio. Prior to uh, his role with Portage, he was the data librarian at Queen's University Libraries academic director of the Queen's Research Data Center, and he established and managed the Queen's Research Data Management Service. And, um, and he's also a proud new grandfather. And I think Elodie is uh, three weeks old today. Three, two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah, tomorrow three weeks. Ahead. Tomorrow's three weeks. Awesome. Jeff, Thanks. it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jen. Um, First of all, thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, let me start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Kingston, Ontario, as a member of the Queen's University community. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. And I'm here today to talk to you about research data management and its many, many intersections with researchers like you and how we go forward with this in the context of the culture change that uh, Matthew made reference to. So our agenda today is has four parts. We're gonna look at what is research data management and we'll do that in a, hopefully a fun way. We'll look at why we should be managing research data. We'll talk about what Endrio Portage is and what Endrio Portage can do for you. So in the spirit of answering the question, what is research data management? I had a special request from Ian to show this video, which I'm going to try and do now. Um, and I'm not sure, I think I might have to uh, 
stop sharing briefly and then share again with, uh, with sound. So I'll just do that and we'll get through this technical stuff together. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm gonna share again, and share sound. Whoops, I stopped under the wrong screen. Share screen. There. We're getting there, folks. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Hello, my name is Dr. Judy Benign. I'm an oncologist at NYU School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Judy Benign. I read your article on B-cell function. I think that I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. I am not an oncologist. I know, but I think I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. Do you have the data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. What I need is the data. Will you share your data? I am not sure that will be possible. But your work is in PubMed Central and was funded by NIH. That is true. And it was published in Science, which requires that you share your data. I did publish in Science. Then I am requesting your data. Can I have a copy of your data? I am not sure where my data is. But surely you saved your data. I did. I saved it on a USB drive. Where is the USB drive? It is in a box. It is in a box at home. I just moved. But can I use your data? There are many boxes. So many boxes. I forgot to label the boxes. Hello again. Thank you for sending me a copy of your data on a USB drive. I received the envelope yesterday. You are welcome, but I will need that back when you are finished. That is my only copy. I did have a question. What is your question? You might find the answer in my article. No. I received the data, but when I opened it up, it was in hexadecimal. Yes, that is right. I cannot read hexadecimal. You asked for my data and I gave it to you. I have done what you asked. But is there a way to read the hexadecimal? You will need the program that created the hexadecimal file. Yes, I will. What is the name of the program? Cytosynth. I do not know this program. It was a very good program. The company that made the program went bankrupt in 2007. Do you have a copy of the program? I do not use this program anymore because the company that made it went bankrupt. Maybe you can buy a copy on eBay. I have good news. You again. I talked to my colleague. She knew a person with a copy of the software. Then why do you need me? Everything you need to know about the data is in the article. I opened the data and I could not understand it. If you have the program, you will find it is clear. Well, I noticed that you called your data fields SAM. Is that an abbreviation? Yes, it is an abbreviation of my co-author's name. His name is Samuel Lee. We call him SAM. I see. And what is the content of the field called SAM1? Ah, yes. SAM1 is the level of CXCR4 expression. And what is the content of the field called SAM2? That is logical if you think about it. What is the content of the field called SAM2? I don't remember. What about SAM3? Is there a guide to the data anywhere? Yes, of course. It is the article that is published in Science. The article does not tell me what the field names mean. Is there any record of what these field names mean? Yes. My co-author knows what the content of SAM2 is and SAM3. 
and Sam 4. Can I talk to your co-author? I'm not sure. I would very much like to talk to your co-author. Well, he was a graduate student. He went back to China two years ago. Can I have his contact information? He is in China. His name is Sam Lee. I think I cannot use your data. You could check the article to see if what you need is there. Please stop talking now. Can I get a signal from somebody if you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, that's great. So I, I just wanna comment on, th these are amazing actors. I thought that the, the pandas giving air quotes with their paws was just brilliant. And I'm always amazed at how good the acting is here. And with the Oscars happening over the weekend, they missed out on this one back in 2012. Anyway, onward and upward. We're going to now ask the question, why manage research data? Well, it's because it is good practice. Um, it will help ensure the dependability and accuracy and validity of your data, thereby strengthening confidence in the research you conduct. It will enhance rep replicability. And finally, it will sol solidify uh, a commitment to research culture of transparency and accountability, which is part and parcel of what the tri-agency policy is trying to accomplish. It's also because it's practical. It will enable you to be better organized and conduct your research more uh, systematically. It will protect, protect against costly data loss through considerations like proper backup procedures. It'll help you share your data better and appropriately and increase your exposure through data publication and citation, which can contribute to tenure and promotion. And obviously the other is the policy that's come down recently is, is and will make your uh, adhering to research data management best practices a requirement. What keeps me up at night are two things. One is the notion of publicly funded research data being scooped up by commercial interests and having to pay to gain access to these data. And we all know examples of where that happens in academic outputs. Second, I'm focused on preventing the loss of data. In the early days of the pandemic, I was called into Queen's University on a Sunday morning. We were still able to get into the library at that time. In any case, the wall of my office at Queen's had been broken into on Saturday evening and my laptop was stolen. So it can happen to you. So turning to Portage, let's start off, a little back, start off with a little background. Portage was initiated in 2015 by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, who recognized the need for national level research data management coordination and support in Canada. The success of this grassroots bottom-up initiative has led us to now, six years later, seeing Portage join the new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, or NDRIO, which is responsible for national level support of research data management, advanced research computing, and research software. Portage joined Andrio on April 1st, 2021. The Portage network is dedicated to the shared stewardship of research data in Canada through developing a national culture of research, fostering a community of practice for research data, and building national research data services and infrastructure. So what is Endrio Portage? It is largely the same as it has been before it joined Endrio, and it consists of a network of experts mentioned by Jennifer earlier, training and outreach, services, policies, and best practices, tools, and infrastructure platforms. All of these are researcher-centric and service-oriented. But the work of Endrio Portage addresses a much lar larger vision Andrew Portage frames its work around the entire research data management lifecycle, including planning, collecting and analyzing data, publishing, depositing and preserving data, and ultimate reuse. And it is strategically layered a diverse network of experts over this lifecycle, 
to provide targeted expertise and support for Canadian researchers. The network includes a range of expert groups, including a data management planning expert group, a group for curation, for sensitive data, one supporting the use of data repositories, one for preservation, long-term storage of data, and one for discovery and metadata, as well as a research intelligence expert group, a national training expert group, which Jennifer is deeply involved in, and a Dataverse North expert group looking at the Dataverse repository platform. As Jennifer mentioned, there are 140 plus experts from over 60 different organizations represented in the network. Government funding through Endrio has allowed Portage to grow the level of support it provides to its national network of volunteer experts and as a consequence to all researchers across Canada. This support is framed around the research data management lifecycle, much like the expert groups, and includes a range of coordinator and other positions hired by Endrio to work with and for the Canadian research community on data management. So in addition to the 140 plus volunteer members of our network, we have our national Andrew Portage Secretariat. And here they are smiling, all their smiling faces. Fundamentally, Andrew Portage was established to help researchers and institutions meet their research data management needs. A focal point of our efforts has been addressing requirements of the recently launched tri-agency funders RDM policy which has both institution-facing and researcher-facing requirements, as Matthew described. Andrew Portage has made some highly visible and impactful progress in helping research address, researchers address these requirements. These include a national RDM strategy template, a national online bilingual data management planning tool called the DMP Assistant, and national multidisciplinary repository options. The institutional research data management strategy has a lot of work being done in this space, but the template that we developed covers off four areas that institutions need to think about or should think about when developing a strategy. They include raising awareness, assessing readiness, formalizing practices around RDM, and defining a roadmap for the future. Jennifer just completed a range, I believe it was eight videos uh, associated with development of these strategies that will be deployed in English and French very soon. Turning to data management planning, the question arises, why plan? So as this little girl is asking her mother, why do we can so much, mommy? One could reframe this to be, why do we plan so much, mommy? to which the mother replies, because zombies are coming, dear. So we plan in order to protect valuable research data, metadata, and code from the looming zombie apocalypse and other more likely disasters such as fires, floods, hardware failures, human error, and yes, theft, as I personally experienced. Portage, in collaboration with the University of Alberta, offers a national online bilingual data management planning tool called the DMP Assistant. This tool was developed, was translated professionally to make a good, the bilingual, good on the bilingual requirement. It was validated by a Francophone RDM expert and contributes to global internationalization efforts. In addition, it promotes living documents to be updated and shared. These DMPs are considered living documents. It generates outputs in funder-ready formats and supports cloning of DMPs for use in similar projects going over time. The DMP Assistant consists of both the tool or software platform, including a growing number of discipline-specific, I'm sorry, tools or software platform, and it also includes templates. So it's a tool in its software sense, but it's a series of templates to actually walk people through the process of developing a DMP. In addition to that, we have some discipline specific templates that were added recently and a number of exemplar DMPs that people can refer to. 
A prototypical DMP template has seven sections shown here, each posing two or three questions. Guidance is provided to help you in each of these sections. Let's turn our attention now to the tri-agency requirement to deposit data in a recognized repository. Storage technology is pushing the limits of how much data we can store. Estimates from bacterial genetics suggest that the entire corpus of the world's knowledge could be stored in around one kilogram of DNA. But the ability to store massive amounts of data is just part of the challenge in securing data for future discovery and reuse. This is where reputable data repositories and the highly qualified people who run them come in. There are many re reputable discipline specific data repositories in use by Canadian researchers today. In addition, there are two major national repository options supported by Andrea Portage. The first of these is a national instance of the widely used Dataverse repository platform, which is run by the Ontario Council of University Libraries through Scholars Portal, has 55 participating institutions and growing, and over 3,000 data sets representing over three terabytes of data. The second national repository option is FERDER, or the Federated Research Data Repository. FERDER is a scalable, big data capable, geographically distributed repository, as well as being a data discovery portal. Currently, there are over 150 data sets and 23 terabytes of data in FERDER, and it was launched in full production early March of this year. As I mentioned, FERDER also provides a national discovery service, which allows or helps improve discovery of Canadian research data, breaks down repository silos, drives traffic to existing repository sites, and improves interoperability between Canadian and other international platforms, such as the European Union's open air platform, where Canadian metadata are now located as well. There are a lot of other things Andrew Portage is up to. Two of note are funding initiatives that are underway as we speak. One is a core trust seal repository certification pilot. This is aimed to improve the trustworthiness of repositories that researchers would make use of. The second is a stewardship of COVID-19 research data funding call that is out currently and encouraging, will be encouraging the curation of COVID-19 related data into a reputable repository. Looking forward, Portage will be looking at improving data discovery, developing and deploying a national RDM training strategy. And if you go to our webpage, there are a lot of research uh, data management training resources available to you. Growing a national network of data curation, supporting national preservation services, taking care of data in the long term, addressing issues related to sensitive data, and there are a number of projects there, working with domains to address discipline specific issues, promoting data management planning and best practices through training and other outreach activities, advancing repository certification, as I already mentioned, promoting and supporting the use of persistent identifiers such as DOIs and ORCID IDs, and identifying and fostering synergies between research data management, advanced research computing, and research software. All of this by listening to and supporting researchers in their work. I do wanna thank our partners for all of the progress we've made. It has been a, a very exciting and long road to this point, but we're excited to be where we are within Andreo. And I will certainly welcome questions as I'm sure Matthew will as well. Back to you, Jen. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Again, a, a whirlwind tour through the, uh, the world of Portage and, uh, and a great one it was. So now that we've had a couple of high level overviews of what data management, research data management is all about, um, we're gonna talk to a number of people who are working with research data on an everyday basis, um, the ways they go about managing that data and the challenges they face in doing so. So to do that, we have with us today four folks from, well, I'd say across the country, but actually they're all on the Western side of the country. So Western Canada represent. Um, 
Starting off in alphabetical order, we have Aaron Brown, who works for the Tecumloops Tesohutmuk group as the museum archivist and curator, where she oversees all aspects of archives, document, and artifact management, and the integration of language revitalization projects within archival fonds. She also serves on the Emergency Management Committee and liaises with other departments specializing in scenario planning and records management. Joel Minion is the Qualitative Research Lead with the Health Technology Assessment Unit in the University of Calgary's Cumming School of Medicine. As a researcher, he's been managing qualitative data for over a decade, both in Canada and the UK, where he has affiliate researcher status with Newcastle University, and he was also a librarian earlier in his career. And once a librarian, always a librarian, I think is the, is the saying. Faye Strohschein is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Calgary in the Faculty of Nursing. She completed her PhD in nursing at McGill in 2020, conducting a qualitative study of treatment decision making among older adults diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Her current research is focused on aligning healthcare delivery with the needs and concerns of older adults with cancer and their families. And Laura Super is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia with Dr. Robert Guy. She is passionate about many things, especially science, education, and the arts, as well as botany, ecology, and sustainability research. Laura's PhD work is on the phytobiome, which involves plants, associated organisms, and the environment. And this research involves much big data, such as microbiome data. So these are our panelists today, and uh, I'm going to be asking them a series of questions to which I know they will have fantastic answers. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A session where you can chat with them and with our other presenters as well. Oh, how are we going to start? Who, where are we going to start? Okay, so the first question is going to be, what kinds of data are you working with? And I just finished reading Laura's bio and she told us a little bit about the kinds of data that she's working with. So Laura, why don't we start with you and you can give us a bit more detail about what you're working with. Sure. Um, so for my, <clears throat> can everyone hear me properly? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Yep, nope, you're good. So for my PhD research, I'm looking at the phytobiome, which to give you an idea is imagine a potted plant in your house because that's easier for people. And it's more than just the plant. It has fungi and bacteria all over its surfaces, its roots and shoots. So I'm really interested in how climate change affects those particular biomes on your plant. So the idea is there's plant data, so biomass data. I also am looking at things outside in the actual field sites. So there's associated um, plant data, so other trees and plants and shrubs. And then there's the microbiome data. So there's different layers of data. So one of the things that I've been doing is using a lot of data management because I'm sifting through not only DNA data for bacteria, fungi, um, but I'm also sifting through data on plants. And so it's different types of data that I'm sifting through as well. And one more short, small thing is I'm actually also working on a project with an, another researcher that's bird and bat data, that's huge files. So that's audio, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, not in my thesis, that would be too much. I had audio data in my PhD and it, you know, big files big files. Faye, how about you? Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, so I have sort of two sets of data um, that I was going to talk about for my PhD work. It was qualitative data that I had worked with. So that did include audio recordings of interviews and phone calls with participants, as well as transcriptions of that audio data. Um, I had also asked my participants um, to keep diaries during their um, cancer trajectories. Um, so I had these paper books that they gave me um, with, their, with their writings over time. Um, and I also had my own field notes um, from interactions with them. And so I had interviewed them prior to treatment and then I followed them during treatment and interviewed them again after treatment. So some people I followed for three months, other people I followed up to 18 months. 
Um, and so I, I met with them on about a monthly basis to touch base and see how they were doing. Um, those became the participant diary entries for some participants um, through phone calls or brief visits. Um, so those I was also documenting those interactions. Um, they pointed me to sometimes newspaper articles or posters that had influenced their thinking about treatment decision making. So I held on to those as well. Um, and throughout I was keeping track of my methodological and analytic memos. So I had 18 participants in my thesis study, um, but I ended up with over 500 sort of instances of, of data with these people over time. Um, so that was a learning process as I went of how to keep track of and manage that data. Um, and so now um, for my postdoc, my focus is shifting a little bit um, to health services research. Um, so for the first part of my postdoc, I'm currently working on um, developing a proposal for a secondary analysis of health data, um, looking at um, experiences and outcomes for people with cancer here in Alberta. So those, um, so there's six different data sets that I'm going to be doing a secondary analysis and age analysis to look at particularly the experiences of older adults with cancer. And so the, these data sets include clinical and administrative data pulled from, extracted from multiple um, health systems data here in Alberta, and also um, patient questionnaires, so satisfaction questionnaires, patient reported outcomes that have been um, completed by patients um, during their cancer experience. Um, this is primarily primarily um, quantitative data, but there are some open-ended responses as well. The sizes of the data bases, um, data sets that I'll be working with varies. I think the smallest is about 300 patients and the largest is over 62,000 instances with about 29,000 participants. So, um, so sort of a different, different kind and set of data than what I worked with for my thesis. Wow, we're only through two people and we've got like the whole range of data here practically. And yet we're going to get more. Joel, what kinds of data are you working with? Hi everyone and, and greetings from Calgary. My data are somewhat similar to Faye's, especially her, um, her PhD data. So I, I've been a researcher, I finished my PhD in 2010 and I've basically been a jobbing researcher for the last 11 years. Um, and my work is primarily um, undertaking qualitative health research. So I'm interviewing and observing um, participants across a range that goes from clinicians to um, researchers to data and IT specialists and data administrators, because a lot of my work is around um, how data is used through to the other end being patients and research participants and different publics and social groups. Um, and maybe just to fill in a bit more of what Faye was saying. So I just finished um, interviewing, I think 15 clinicians in BC around ECMO, which is a life support system or life support mechanism that replaces the, the heart and or lungs. And we're trying to get an idea of how ECMO is used in BC. So a single interview with a clinician, and this is just, uh, unlike Faye, we were, uh, I'm only interviewing people once. We have you know, the proverbial um, consent form, but we often have a tailored interview guide, which I have to keep. Um, audio recording, I'm a, a bit of a stickler. I always audio record my interviews with two recorders because I've had cases where in fact both have died um, unexpectedly. And then also those files are often broken up because if someone says, oh, excuse me for a minute, you pause or you turn off the record, the recording and you come back. So you can end up with a lot of audio recording. They get transcribed. We do our transcribing professionally. So we have the original version, then we check it against the audio, then we anonymize it. Um, then we have an anonymization key. I never overwrite the files because I want a good audit trail going backwards. I do interview notes right after the interview. I do analytic notes as I'm rereading every interview. I have a glossary. On this project, I haven't kept a research journal, but that would typically be something else. And then there's often other documents like organizational documents that we use for analysis as well. And so all of those, that's just one interview. And if, you know, I was on a project many years ago where we did 300 interviews and this was, a, and it was across multiple 
uh, universities as well. And this is just a huge amount of very deep, rich data. And it's just qualitative. When you get into quantitative data, of course, you're getting even, even larger data sets. All right, I'm overwhelmed, but you know. <laughs> And maybe it's just because it's still early in the morning here. Erin, I think you're taking a bit of a different route from uh, for most of the other people here. In, yeah, in I'm, I'm taking a, yeah, a bit of a different route. Um, first, um, excuse me, I, I want to say uh, Aaron Brown and Squawks to come up to support me elsewhere. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. I am Erin Brown. I work at the uh, Tecumlips Disequipment Indian Band in Tecumlips, uh, Kamloops, uh, British Columbia. Sorry, I'm so used to saying everything in Sequipment's gene these days that uh, switching back and forth between English and that is some, sometimes a little uh, challenging. And you'll have to forgive me. Uh, I. I am working from my home office and uh, it's an apartment and housekeeping has decided to go crazy cleaning stuff behind me in the hallway. So it's, it's an interesting day. Um, but to your question, uh, I was hired on with the Tecumlops as their museum archivist and very quickly they found out that I had a background in um, emergency management and other sorts of data and data management practices. And so um, I am the museum curator. Uh, like Jen said, I work in emergency management. And what this means is um, I do, uh, I, our, our archives and our museum is a total archive. So we have audio files, we have video files, we have transcripts, we have, you name it, we have it. We have, um, we have all sorts of digital images um, and, and pictures of just across the board. Um, we have paper, phone, we have, well, phone is kind of a, question right now, but we have a whole lot of uh, paper documents. Um, we have, um, and it's it's for the Tecumlopes nation. So there's um, the political aspect of the nation. There's the social aspect of the nation. There's the cultural aspect. It's, it's all everything sort of intertwined. And then since I took over the role of the curator, uh, I'm looking after artifacts and all the artifact data and preservation information for that, um, keeping track of, uh, learning to keep track of where things are. Um, I'm in the, in the middle of implementing a content management system and teaching people how to do all of those things. Um, and as word has sort of spread around, I'm sort of the overall research and data maven for the band where it's like, oh, how do I manage this thing? How do I do this? How do I, Aaron, how do I keep track of my email so I can find crap? Um, just just any, any of those things. And so I, I'm teaching, I'm teaching my, my band um, good, data management practices along a whole gamut of stuff, but it's mostly qualitative and not quantitative. Awesome. I, I'm sorry, I had to have a little laugh at the, the thing that might be a phone, but might not. Um, if you're an archival nerd, it was funny. If you're not an archival nerd, it was just archival nerds nerdy. Um, <laughs> So going from that then, um, you're all working with a whole range of, of data, of different kinds of data, of data in different forms. So the next question is going to be, perhaps naturally, what kinds of data management practices have you been using in your work? And uh, Faye, let's start with you. 
Um, yeah, thank you. I I guess there's the the practices that I used for my thesis work and the ones I'm planning for my postdoc work. So for my PhD work, um, some of the things that became really important were um, having a spreadsheet, a, a data management spreadsheet of every interaction with every patient, um, every participant, and documenting what type, type of data was generated from each of those interactions. Um, De-identification of, of data, as Joel spoke to, of, you know, not just um, taking their name off and putting a code, but how do I make sure that, um, you know, in the transcript, sensitive, identifiable information is, is removed, and that in any presentation of my results of quotes and repetitive quotes of, within a thesis with the same pseudonym, that it doesn't become identifiable for the participants. Um, also confidentiality agreements with transcriptionists, um, having file names that make sense so I could find things um, both for the raw data files and also um, within in vivo software um, and protecting the data in both of those instances while keeping it available um, and at hand for analysis. And yeah, just that encryption and password protection, um, both for ongoing access and also thinking of long-term storage. Um, in terms of my postdoc, and I think what, how I ended up here today was um, working on a, a DMP plan with the Portage Assistant. It was quite interesting. I'm actually a member of a, a research ethics board at a hospital in Montreal. And so my first exposure to the DMP plan was in reviewing a study proposal where they had used that. And as a reviewer, I just thought, oh, this is great. It's here. They've thought of it, done, check. And so when it came time to do my own proposal now for ethics, I just thought that's what I want to have. So it just goes done, check <laughs> as it goes through the reviewers there. Um, and so that has been a really good process, given that this is a really different type of data than I'm used to working with. So it's really forced me to think through a lot of um, a lot of the logistics that I probably wouldn't even have considered until I was actually up to my elbows in things. Um, and I think being at a new university, I had done both my master's and my PhD at McGill, so kind of knew how things worked there inside and out. And the health system there, I was a clinician, I was a nurse working in the hospital, so that I was familiar also with all the data systems there. So coming to Alberta, coming to University of Calgary, it's been starting from scratch. So I think the DMP plan in sort of um, the, the portage assistant and working to fill in those blanks, it's led me on a bit of a scavenger hunt um, through, um, through ethics, through, I made a list here, <laughs> through, um, you know, data scientists at the secure computing data storage um, at the U of C, through research data management, speaking with librarians, um, talking to various health research ethics boards to kind of get the information I needed and figure out where I needed to go for that. And then also within the health system, um, figuring out the route, routes um, that I needed to do to establish a data disclosure agreement and how that worked when I had a supervisor within Alberta Health and a supervisor at the U of C and I'm a student and how does that all fit and I'm not a clinician now and so wearing different hats and how that changed um, what people are willing to do and how that works and where things are situated. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of um, the practices that I've been engaging in right now have been really that planning piece um, and negotiating through those academic and health systems to, to set up a plan that will actually be feasible and work and meets all those criteria um, that everybody has for, for data management practices. Yeah, that's awesome. Planning is, is such a key to everything, um, as I'm sure we'll talk about later on um, and have talked about before. Um, Laura, how about your data management practices? For sure. And I also just wanted to, I forgot to do the land acknowledgement because I was nervous. Please. So I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on uh, the traditional ancestral and ceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And I'm also really interested um, in more reconciliation than just land acknowledgements. So anyone Absolutely. can contact me at this next separate time. 
So in terms of data management, sorry, I just want to make sure I put that in there because I think they're really important. Um, in terms of data management, there's lots of things. And part of the reason there's lots of things is I've worked with people using their data and going, just like that video that I laughed all the way through that you played, it's like, oh dear. So I'm trying to make sure I don't replicate that. I'm sure I'm still replicating it. So I'm definitely going to go per portage and look more to see if there's anything I can do. But so far being a biologist, because we don't get a lot of training in this, I've been making sure to use open source tools like R that are scripting. So you actually have it which is great if you show your supervisor, even though your supervisor mine is almost retired, who doesn't know how to use R. He can if he wanted to, but at least I can replicate it with a click and then change it quickly and change again. He's like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's much quicker than say a point and click program. I also have been really getting into using open science framework when I have a lot of undergrad help, helpers and when they want to convert something over, I have part of that where you, they can't modify the data and then they can drag and drop it to another um, container essentially and then play with it all they want. <laughs> so then I don't worry. So that's a way of having data integrity is having these open source tools. You know, another thing that I do is say I'm working on a conference abstract with data with my supervisor, for example, I'll have both an Excel file, which allows us to have it in yellow and all these different things or also a CSV. So I make both copies so that I right away will have a copy that is easy to store with the CSV file. And then one that, you know, so it's gonna happen to Excel formatting in the future. Um, another thing that I've been doing on purpose is going to talk a lot to UBC ARC, which is, um, has something called Sockeye, which is this amazing cluster like Compute Canada, but it's just a smaller version at, at UBC. And what's really great about that is they come and they talk to you about, <laughs> so I've been asking them how to make some scripts that I can even use on the cluster so that I can actually see what I did. They're like, oh, you can just do this. Like, like no, I want it all documented. So I know what happens. So I can explain to anyone, including reviewers. So I've been actually purposely asking computer nerds what best practices are and then incorporating them into my practice. And I think it's something that's always an iterative process. And I asked them, who's the worst of your users? Because we're mostly science people. And they're like biologists. I was like, great, I understand. So I've been really trying to learn a lot of best practices so that I can pass it on. Because I really, in the last question, I'll go into more detail, but I actually think we should start data management with high school students and continue. And I'll explain more about that later because I think the last questions, because then I'll go on my rant of more data management needs. Thank you, that's me. I am looking forward to that rant. And I am, I, everything I was hearing that you were saying was making me happy, especially about the open source stuff. That's that's so awesome. Um, Aaron, what are your data management practices? I know you've had them drilled into me and into you in the same way I have. Yes, um, and I, so I wanna start out by saying that one, uh, I couldn't program my way out of a paper bag. So the idea of going to the computer nerds and saying, hey, uh, how do you do this? How do I uh, break it and make it better and explain it to everybody and have that complete traceability for it? That is that is totally my language right there. Um, and I sort of came into this, like I didn't know at all what I wanted to do when I grew up and I attended, um, I attended a conference and it was on language revitalization and it was for writing grants. And there was a brief little bit in there about how to manage your data at one point. And I was the only archivist in the room. And the presenters just kept going, so Aaron, what do you think? So Aaron, what do you think? I'm like, okay, so here's all of this. and they were stressing throughout the, the presentation, get your archivists, get your information professionals involved early, include them at the beginning. And I was like, yes, please do this. As you're planning out your projects, go see people. So like Laura said, go see computer people, go see these people who know and, and manipulate data on the regular and get their input at as early as you start thinking about your project and say, hey, I, I've got this idea. And that's really, at that point, they, they 
asked me if I wanted to come work with them. I'm like, eh, I can, I'm still a student, but that really put the idea in my head that that's what I wanted to do was to help people as early in their process. And like Laura said, getting this into people's head, high school even, is a beautiful point where that that's, so I, I, I ranted early, uh, I apologize for that, but it, it all goes into, um, so, I work within the band for my department, which is language and culture and is archives, is language revitalization, is artifacts. And I work with them and I have external stakeholders and, and people I work with, people wanting to come in and do research. So I've got research requests and people wanting to come in and do that. And I deal with so what do you want to do with your project? So it's internal, external facing that way. And then I have internal, external facing within the organization of, so we do things a certain way in the language and culture department. And that is supposed to influence the way everybody does everything in the organization since it needs to be led by language and culture. So I outface that way. And it's things like, helping people with code books, helping people with file naming conventions, helping people with just understanding uh, to use open source things or to use lossless formats. Um, understanding that if you put something up on the internet, you inherently lose a little bit of your control over it. Uh, things like that, uh, helping people understand that you should probably have an intermediary between the raw files that you're using and the output that you want. So having a content management system of some ilk, and I use content management system in a really broad term in this way. Um, that's been a lot of what I've been doing. And None of those practices were sort of there when I came in. So I also do a lot of education and outreach in and out of our department. And I do a lot of policy and procedure writing. Which is the least fun part, but I actually really necessary. like it. No, I actually really like it. I'm that's 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 my nerd. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody, you, you know, wants help writing policy and procedure. There you go. I'll put you in touch. Contact um, information is there. That's true. That is true. Joel, how about you? What are you doing practice wise? Well, I think I think what we can take away from what the panelists have said is especially in my field in qualitative health research, but even more broadly there are still not a lot of established data management practices right at the local level. And so basically virtually everything I've done or I've done as a member of a team has been self-developed. And the way I look at it, and again, it comes out of what the panelists say is when I look at data management practices, you sort of have a 5% and a 95%. And the 5% is, um, meeting funder and institutional and ethics data management requirements. And often those are policies and they're not specific, but it's critical that you meet them. So it's small, but it's really vital. But 95% of it is managing data at what I call the research coal face. It's, it's making sure that you or your team um, are supported in terms of, of the data management and that you meet your deliverables. And the analogy that I like to use is that it's like marriage. 5% of marriage is the rules and regulations about getting married, about your rights and responsibilities as a married couple, how you get divorced if it comes to that. But 95% of marriage is living with the other person. And there's nothing in the 5% that tells you how, whose family you're going to spend Christmas with this year. You make it up as you go along. And so when I was a postdoc and, and the PI, it was a big project and the PI said, you have a library background, you can be our research data manager. I basically went back to my training as a librarian and the two things that really stood out for me and some of these have been mentioned. 
um, one is file names, critical. And I used my interpretation of the Dewey Decimal System to create file names. And so Dewey Decimal is a way that books are organized in a public library primarily. And it's the little number on the spine. So if I go into a public library and I know that 641.5636 is a vegetarian cookbook, I, I've made that connection between the number on the spine and what it is. So if I want to go in and look for history of Calgary in the public library, I go to 971, whatever it is. Um, and so I developed a file naming system in the same way. So I will, in the chat, I've just put in um, the file naming system I developed. And so I can look at a file and know from that file name, it's our study of ECMO, it's a clinician interview, it was participant four, it was on a certain day. And the CA means that it's been checked and it's been anonymized and it's a transcript. And as I mentioned earlier, all the files I have for the same participant all have this root number. So I can trace everything connected to that participant back to that basic file name. Um, and amazingly enough, very few researchers do that. So many researchers just name something on the spur of the moment. As a colleague of mine used to say, you know, say when she got to the end of her PhD, the dissertation was in fact, dissertation, final, 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 final. It doesn't mean terribly much. The other key thing I think is the, the folder structure you use for keeping your files. And I have five basic folders, which I use all the time, tweak them a bit, but my folders are admin, which is all the correspondence and so forth governance stuff, because we always have ethics and recruitment, the data itself, the analysis, and the outputs, which is papers or reports and so forth. And those parallel the process that you work through when you're going through a project. So between the file naming system and the folder structure, I, or if I'm hit by a bus, someone else on the team can say, okay, he probably did this and know where stuff is. And that's the stuff they never teach you in the 5%. It's the stuff you have to learn in the 95% that gets you through to the end and make sure that make sure that you've met the 5% requirements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a project I worked on during my, my PhD work, which is not related to my PhD, but my supervisor liked to name things with people's initials. So this project that I was working on was JAM, which was Jen, Alexis and Molly which had nothing to do with jam, had nothing to do, you know, it, it was entirely unrelated to that. So if somebody came in and looked at that file, it'd be like, why is this called jam if it's related to speech convergence? No reason, just because it was our initials. But, so Don't I was gonna say the other, <laughs> the other real problem with audio recordings is you get the default file name off of the audio recorder. And a lot yes. of research researchers never change that. No, and they it, don't. all it has is the date and that's it. And usually the format that the file is in. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I think now we'll get into our, our, our third question. I was thinking about breaking it up, but looking at the time, I think we'll do it as, as one two part question, um, which is what are the advantages of uh, engaging in good research data management practices that you found? And what challenges have you faced? Or do you, do you see being faced in general? in doing this. Um, and I think based on the order I'm going in, I think, Joel, you're first up. Uh, the advantages, um, really, when the key advantages of really good data management is um, stuff that's findable, you know, uh, on a team process, you never know when someone's gonna come or go from that team. And it means that there's a structure there. I had a situation on a large project where out of 300 transcripts, we had three go missing and we didn't know where they went. Someone just basically took the files and managed to delete them. And because I had a file naming system, I could know what the file names were and I could go to the IT department and say, go back through your tapes and find these three files. Really critical. I think, and this was mentioned off the top and maybe by Jeff, I think in health research or research in particular, good research data management practices are what researchers owe to research participants. You know, you wouldn't put your money into the bank and not expect them to have good practices. We owe it to the people who are giving us their data to do this properly. Um, in terms of challenges, um, senior researchers are still 
in my in my experience, really bad data managers. They didn't come up through a system at all that required these things. Um, I think qualitative data uh, qualitative data in particular is still the poor cousin to quantitative data when it comes to uh, data management. Quantitative data are very sexy. Qualitative data are just messy. They're hard to de-identify. Um, they're very hard to deposit, um, even though that's starting to come up. And then last, the last challenge, and I apologize for this already, but I think in Canada in particular, I don't think this is internationally the case. It certainly wasn't in the UK. I think one of the challenges with research data management is that it's fallen under the purview of academic libraries and librarians, which at one level is very good because they're the organizers. But the problem is librarians don't as a rule do research. And I was a research librarian before I got my PhD and I thought, oh, I got this one sussed, I know what I'm doing. And it was when I was finished and got out into the field, I thought I had no clue what I was doing. There's a knowledge that comes from doing this research day after day, year after year that you never get as a librarian. And I, so I think we really need um, to have much more co-production of the resources and the services between the libraries and the institutions and actually involving researchers. And there was, I'll just end on an example that I know of in, in the Netherlands at the Technical University in Delft, they have this amazing research data ma management system, which sits in the library, but isn't of the library. And it's staffed almost entirely by people with their PhDs. And they put data stewards in each of their, their nine or 10 faculties. And the idea is that it's a dialogue. It's an ongoing dialogue. And it's, it is sort of what I see as best practice. And I'd love it if we could develop systems like that in Canada. Because um, I think what we're doing is good, but I can think it can be so much better. And I'll end there. That sounds like an exciting future to me. I like it. Faye, advantages and challenges. Similar to Laura, I'm going to start with my land acknowledgement because I missed it too. The, the U of C has been acknowledged, but I want to st just um, say that I live and work farther north on Treaty 6 territory um, in central Alberta. And it's such a privilege to live and work and play on these lands. Um, and those lands are very precious. So just wanted to add that as well <laughs> in my nervousness too. Um, so in terms of advantages and disadvantages, I think one thing for my thesis work that I found was a huge advantage because I had meticulously kind of kept a track of how much data I had collected, both in terms of the instances of my interactions with participants, as well as just the overall hours of audio data and things, that um, I was able to demonstrate the rigor. You know, when people hear a sample size of 18, um, research often gets written off as what, you know, what are you really gonna show? But when I can say I've had over 500 interactions with these people and hundreds of hours of audio recording, you know, they take a bit of a second glance. So I think that's just from, a, um, you know, in terms of a recognition of the work that is being done in a project, um, being able to document and articulate that I think is a huge advantage. Um, in terms of other advantages, I think, um, the DMP assistant, like again, just going through that plan has been a huge advantage, you know, of being able to have that in guiding me and my learning in a new institution, and also just not getting into a muck later. I'm hoping <laughs> that it, you know, kind of sets things out on the right foot. I think the challenges that I've found, um, you know, with the current um, finding my way through uh, that it really has been about putting the pieces together that everybody seems to hold a different piece to the puzzle um, and have different opinions and so you kind of speak with one person and saying what about this oh no you need to talk to ethics about that or you need to talk to the IT people about that or you know so it's I mean it's a great learning and a great opportunity to build connections um, but those lines and those connections are very tenuous and difficult to follow often. Even websites, um, you know, don't 
make those links, um, you know, in the names of people and connections and who's all involved, it really is about following the threads. Um, and so I think I've been very fortunate to find my way to the right people I've needed, but it's taken a couple months, you know, it is a huge investment of time um, to be able to do that legwork. Um, and I think there are ways that could be facilitated um, with how that information is shared. Um, I think the the challenge I found through my PhD studies was in terms of of changing standards of data management practices um, throughout my PhD um, and often finding out about those by happenstance. So not always, um, you know, a consistent communication, um, even from ethics and things of, you know, this is what we are expecting at this point, you know, especially, you know, moving from sort of paper to digital um, processes. Um, so I think just around that communication of best practices and finding the people who know those things. I think, you know, and I think the other, tension I find, um, you know, similar, I think, to what Joel was saying in terms of where the rubber hits the road and what you're managing as a researcher versus, you know, the people who are sitting in IT, in library sciences, in ethics, who know the ideal picture, know that 5%. But really like getting that insight of like, what do I do on a day to day basis to make this work and feasible? And I think it's often that tension between um, and I think what we owe to our participants is not only the security of their data, but the usefulness of it. So I think sometimes there is a picture where you can make data so secure, but then <laughs> being able to access it in a ready way to be able to analyze and present and share the insights from that data becomes untenable. So I think as a researcher, it is um, juggling that and, um, and, and making that work. So that's where I'll leave that. Great. Thank you. Laura, over to you. Yeah, I've been itching to do this. So. I know you was, have. <laughs> <laughs> so I drew a picture actually while I was thinking about it. So as an ecologist, you study things like, you know, I'm one one organism and then I'm in a population and then a community and then an ecosystem and then there's a planet. So it's the same problem with data management. If, you know, if you can get your project to work, right, that's great. But it's part of a bigger ecosystem. So if you're part of the ecosystem is broken, it affects everything. So as I said to some of the people who recruited us to this panel, I said, one of the reasons I care so deeply about this issue is I know for some people like, oh, that's boring data management. We all think it's cool because, you know, we're here. <laughs> but some people go, ugh. And I'm like, well, what about the climate change models that we're using to save our planet? What if they have errors because someone rushed and they don't have it backed up properly and da da da. Given what I've seen behind the scenes with people, I was like, I don't know if that's, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's science article. So, and then another thing is in future with all this big data with facial recognition to be used, for example, to um, incriminate you, I would want the public to know what the algorithms are used and what big data was used and how it was checked because there could be errors in those algorithms. So I think for me, the advantages are clear. If you have good data management, it only it not only helps you as an early career researcher or a, a mid-career researcher or a later career researcher, because there are later career researchers that care about this, they're trying, they just haven't had the, you know, it's just haven't had all the indoctrination in a good, good way. <laughs> and so I think it's very clear that it allows you to do, it saves you lots of time in the long run. It may be a lot of work at the beginning, but it actually saves you a huge amount of time in the long run. It allows you to be a better collaborator. It also lets you really trust your data. You won't be like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> right? Some of the challenges I feel are culture change. I do feel like, and people who interviewed me for this know that I've been doing a kindness project, which is how to, how to increase kindness across this world, but especially academia. And I think one part of data management would be to actually a lot, part of the research cycle on purpose part of tenure, part of being a grad student, to having data management and making it part of the culture so that it's kind to the fact that this takes time. You can't rush this. If you rush this, it will be badly done and there's no point. It's not. So I think it's really important for us to think about what are we looking for as our values for this process? What are the tools? Because we can make tons of tools, but what do we really want 
as a long-term strategy. And then another thing that I really think is necessary is, and I will talk about it again because I just think it's so crucial, is please, please, please help our public schools get this into high school, into computer science classes. And don't stop there. I think NSERC Promo Science and other NSERC and tri council agencies, you know, SHRC and CHIR, sorry, I'm nervous to say it wrong, but I think have funding so you can have a data science for dummies course that even people who don't have access to a computer, say someone's homeless but wants to learn this stuff, can have a basic literacy of how to do a spreadsheet, how to name a file. Because then when they're sitting going, well, I don't know, should we care about this science stuff or this, you know, my health report, they'll have a better idea of what they're dealing with. And I think they, as publicly funded researchers, I think the people who fund us have a right to know because they're, you know, taxpayer dollars, they should get something back for some of the most marginalized, including people that don't usually have access to even computers. So that's what I would really like to see is not just helping our institutional data management, but also teaching those basic data science skills to the general public. And not just in Canada, ideally, but we're, we're a Canadian thing. So I think everyone should have a basic science literacy. So that's that's my thing. Yeah. Awesome. I, I like the big thinking a lot. Erin, I see you've unmuted because you know it's coming to you. Last word. Oh, well, you know, everybody else is, has spoken and there's so much, uh, I mean, there's so much I want to say like off of what everybody else has said and I'm just like, oh, my head is swirling. But I, I think I want to start with one of the greatest advantages is what everybody has sort of said is that it's that findability and it's that responsibility to to the people that you're working with who have entrusted you with their information um and uh sort of challenge and success uh all rolled into one is that you know it, if you are hit by a bus tomorrow or something happens tomorrow that's one of the things that I, I talk about a lot in my work and at my job is if i'm not here tomorrow for whatever reason then somebody needs to be able to go in and just pick up where i left off we have so many projects on the go that it is irresponsible of me to not have good data management and i need to model that like I was thinking a lot about what Laura said about the tiers out from an individual organism all out to an ecosystem. I need to model good data management for myself. And then that needs to spread out through our institutions and within my institution specifically working with a First Nation, we also have cultural responsibility and we have I mean, there's sometimes the weight of it is just sort of like heavy there as well, because we have thousands of years worth of history to make sure we we maintain and we take care of and we revitalize and all of those things. And it's it's not just meeting minutes that's an aspect of culture or it's not just a land survey that's an aspect of culture and one of the the things that i've been doing in my work as well is sort of reorienting trying to get a reorientation in the way people think about this isn't just a some of the things we do aren't just a business venture or aren't just doing them solely for doing them's sake we are engaging in culture and we are stewards of that culture and how do we take care of that and how do we recognize that and then do data management within a culturally responsive way and so these i i went through because now that i'm more or less out of academia i wasn't as privy to the changes that have come up and, and the modifications, but I went through and I looked at uh, the provisions and I apologize because now my cat is going crazy. First it was housekeeping in the hallway. Now my cat is just bonko. Um, but 
having researchers come in and work with indigenous groups and also indigenous groups just working of themselves. I mean, there's 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 so much education to be done. And it's it's really exciting and it's also really challenging. I'm sorry, cat. And Kitty agrees. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all so much. That was uh, a lot of amazing thoughts and ideas and and tips and ways to look in really a very short period of time. Um, and I know some people have had to drop off, but for those of you who are uh, who are here, now we have some time for questions. Um, so I would say, ideally, please put your questions in the question and answer feature, and uh, I will go through and call on people. Oh, and we well, we've got one in the chat as well. The chat is fine too. So I'm going to start with one that came in in the Q and A uh, a while back, um, and I think this is a, this is really interesting because it kind of gets at something we haven't quite got at, and anyone can feel free to answer. Um, what are your tips to begin to organize data and to make it a habit? Where do you start? I might jump in if I could. Um, sure. Sort of at that stage, I think, for this project, and I think the DMP plan, like setting out a plan, to think through what those different pieces are um, is a key step to just starting. And then just even knowing what you should be thinking about. Um, and the assistant gives lots of good tips under each, each sort of topic and category um, to begin thinking about that. Um, and, and to make a commitment, I think, to be structured about it. Because it's really easy when you're rushing after an interview or after some sort of data collection to be like, OK, I just need to do this. I'll deal with it later. Um, but to kind of make it a priority to take that extra five minutes and relabel files and sort them into folders rather than just dumping them. Because, you know, you always say you're going to remember and then, you know, two months goes by and you go back and you're like, when did I do this? Who was this with? And then it's, you know, takes hours to sort out. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, I'd yeah. like to... Oh, oh, go ahead. I, I was I was just gonna jump in on that as well, and I hadn't seen the DMP assistant before I was prepping for this, but um, I, I always want to stress getting somebody who does some sort of information management in on your team, sort of at the ground level, and or who you can task to think about that as almost like their full-time job. Um, even when you're doing emergency management and things are going crazy all around you, there is somebody whose sole task it is, is to manage your information and manage your documentation and do all of those things and make sure all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted and all of that. And like Faye said, taking that breath and renaming your things for good file management practices in good descriptive ways, putting things in appropriate folders, just remembering to breathe and remembering that as much as it may not seem like it, things will actually wait. And this comes first this is something that should come first this should come at the beginning and that's something that has served me and several of my teams well even in emergency situations i think having basic things such as dates and file names if at the very least or even if you have it on a piece of paper like i always always try to put a date on anything I'm doing with data, anything. Cause at the very least, and then also try to have in your planner or your schedule, like what you were doing. Like you, maybe if you're doing something confidential cause some of you work with more um, people related stuff, 
you might put initials of something, like you might put something or code or something just to remind yourself. So you can go back to that in your calendar and be like, I was doing the, and just in case. So I think there's things I often will, in addition to putting things to the cloud, in addition to putting things on a cluster, in addition to doing things on my computer, I often will have like a sheet that's hard copy, like literally hard, like analog. <laughs> because I think that way, if the internet explodes or if whatever somehow i can't access something i still have a general gist like it might not be as in much detail because some of you are doing audio and you won't be able to put that onto a piece of paper but just a list you know like a meta it's like a meta meta <laughs> it's like a list of what are the things so when i'm trying to get all the the data which i'm working on right now with my thesis and it's like there's this and there's this and there's this is like all right let's just write a list of everything that i have and let's break it down and like, imagine you're trying to, that's how I think of it is I, I love having people that you're mentoring because I get mentored too, right? And it's so neat to be mentoring others and being mentored is I'm like, what questions would they ask me? So it's great if you have to think about how would you teach your data if you had to, to someone else? And that will get you questioning your process because I think the best thing from what I was hearing when people were talking and I was like, why don't you just ask yourself questions? Like, does this make sense? Why am I missing this data point? Where did it go? <laughs> so I think just being curious and also just being kind to yourself because I think like we're running around, there's not enough time. Some people have kids, some people have cats, some people have, you know, crazy parents. <clears throat> cough. So the thing is, is you need to be able to kindly take time. I think, as I said, it should be something in our cultural practice where we actually have time every week for this type of thing because oftentimes it's not even put in. Because people like professors are like, oh, whatever, some of them. Why would you do that? I was like, because it's necessary. So I think it's changing. I think the culture is shifting. And I think soon this type of thing won't be necessary to talk about at all because it'll be done. But I don't think that will be for at least 10 years, <laughs> at least. I think it's going to take a while for it to shift. But I'm very excited to see that it's moving. It's really exciting. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? No. All right. Um, so this is a question that came in in the chat, um, and it's for Joel specifically. Uh, could you talk more about the cross department coordination you saw at the uh, Technical University of uh, Delft? Because that sounds really cool. It is really cool. I don't know a ton about it. I, I sort of know a couple of the people connected to it. But um, so what they did, the woman who heads it, um, started the research data management um, service at Cambridge, and then I think got hired by this technical university in the Netherlands, a uh, big university. And she set it up in such a way that, um, as I said before, every faculty has a data steward, and then there's a coordinator of the data stewards, and then a bit of a structure above it. And the idea was that, um, this is almost all quantitative data at the university, but it was a way of formalizing the communication that was within the, the, uh, the university. They got uh, a set amount of funding to pilot it and it was so successful, the university just bought into it and have funded it long-term. So the idea is that you have, um, it's, the best, it's sort of like a hub and spoke model so that the hub is the service, the spokes go out into every faculty. They not only say, these are the services, this is how you, we can help you organize your data or deposit it and so forth. But then they're like mini ethnographers going out and learning what the research projects are, what they're generating, what the challenges they're having, what the services aren't providing. They feed it back in and all the stewards get together and discuss what's going on and they develop new ways to modify the service. Um, that's about the extent of, I think, how I can describe it. They do have a very good website in English. Um, it looks like sort of a regular research data management service, but when you dig into it, you realize there's this unusual structure out there. I think it's the, the, the real challenge with it, of course, and I know this from talking to the, to the head, is funding for it. You know, they lucked out and then they did it well and they got long-term funding. But a lot of universities won't have the funds to even pilot it in the first place. And that's where the challenge is. So it oh, sounds a little bit like, 
Yeah, sounds a little bit like some of the, the work that we're doing with the Portage Network to build up a national network of data curators who are talking mm. to each other and engaging in developing best practices and things like that. Um, yeah, it's good to see these, these networks growing and developing. I, I, sorry, just on that point, I still think one of the key things that's missing though that they are doing is that, you know, in 11 years of being a researcher, and I've talked to colleagues about this, we've really never had a data service come to us and say, tell us more about what you're doing. Tell us, mm -hmm. you know, give us that picture of what it's like, as, as Thea and, and Laura and Aaron have all said, what it's like on the ground, where are the challenges? What's it, what's it like when you, when you end up with conflicts or you end up with, with things you just don't know what to do? That exchange, I think, needs to happen much more. And I think it, it, it feeds into this bigger culture change where um, everyone's being educated by everyone else in the process. And at the moment, I don't think the balance is quite there. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to add, uh, Joel said something that that piqued my, my brain. And he said, many ethnographers and when I do my work, that is, I read a lot of ethnographic theory and I read a lot of ethnographies. And that is something that I think if you want to do good data management and you're still in university, take a class in ethnography. It, it will help being able to ask some of those questions like Laura was talking about, question your own methods, question all of those things. And it will help you be able to uh, see your stories and your context in, in different ways. And um, just for if there are any archival nerds out there like Jen and myself, I mean, context, that's archival buzzword right there. So ethnography and context and all of those things, I mean, it just, it all goes into one. And that's that's how I approach, um, I had a, a consulting session yesterday and I have another one today after we're done with this with some other departments of my band. And one of the first questions I'm asked is, so how can I make this better? And I I always stop and I say, pause before we can make anything better. Tell me your context. Tell me about what you do. Tell me your things. And I think that's a key aspect of research, man research data management, just the whole spadoinkle. That was for you, Jen. A technical term. A technical and term. <laughs> And Erin, what I really liked when you were talking about context, which I know I'm not in archival, so I don't know that I don't get the inside joke, but I can kind of get it. Um, but the idea is that we are in a turning point where we're trying to push for different ways of knowing that have often been marginalized. And so why not think about why is someone struggling? What are the barriers to them doing proper data management? Maybe there's someone who's never done proper data management. Maybe they're at a time in their career like, I'm almost done. I don't need to worry about this, but they do. <laughs> so I think, or maybe there's someone I've had undergrads and they can't use Excel. I was like, aren't you supposed to be digital native times a thousand? But no. So I think the key thing is never, never assume and always ask questions. And I think what's really neat is because we're going through a transformational change of like who's being locked off the table, what approach, like, I think it's also like, what processes are we using? Like, don't take for granted that science is a culture or, you know, certain social science things are a culture or certain medical science things are a culture. Like, it's, why are we doing it that way? Maybe it's not the best way. Maybe our best practices are not the best practices. So as we have discussions, what I really love working with people that are in different areas than me and always being really, really not that smart because you're with them in a new field and you're like, oh my goodness, I have no nothing again and again is you learn that there's many different um, signature pedagogies, which the jargon just means that different ways of teaching in different areas. And you just change the wording and you change a bit of the modify things. But, you know, people are all trying to get to the end, which is, you know, find a truth or understand how people are acting or how plants are working or, you know, whatever you substitute it in. But I do think that there are certain practices, for example, when you look at websites, like what's a good website? 
some people are like, oh, it's fine. And then it's like, oh, it's a horrible website. So there's like, you know, there's good enough. And then there's grand, you know what I mean? So I think our best practices right now might be best, but there might even be gold standard down the road. Like once we get the CPR done, and <laughs> get people kind of working, then maybe we can push for even more. So I think for now, we'll have to just get people onto the best practices. But I do think it's what's exciting about this area is it, I think it's constantly going to evolve. Like what I've been finding really exciting with like li librarians, because I don't know, I love libraries, is a lot of them are really into this big data movement. I was like, who knew <laughs> it's library? So I think it's just exciting to take these combined ways of knowing, question things, ask people like, I'd love to ask some of the other panelists what they've been doing in their different respective and exchange knowledge across disciplines because then you can really see where the gaps are because you're so used to doing your way but maybe that doesn't even really make sense but you're just used to it because you've been doing it like everyone else so i think aaron and i was really neat at listening to you and so with the other people too because it's just it really sparks different ideas in my head awesome I think if I might be able to add just one more thought about that context piece too. I think that's really salient, Erin, um, you know, both in terms of the context within which we're managing data, but also generating data. And I think our conversation has focused a lot on data management practices, and we haven't touched so much on the data sharing. Um, but I think that's one thing that kind of lingers at the back of my mind as a qualitative researcher of what does that look like for qualitative research, but I would ar also argue, I think it applies to quantitative too, in terms of how that context within which the data is generated and created, how that is um, reflected and how that is often separated from the data in a data sharing context. So, you know, when I think of my qualitative data, I can write field notes about, you know, where we were, how it happened, up the up the yin yang to the extent you know but somehow that relational context of who i am and who the participant is i will never be able to fully document that um, in any type of um, metadata and that interaction and that relational context shapes how i interpret the data and the lack of that will impact how anybody else interprets that data. So I think that is a big question that still needs to be asked in terms of data sharing. And I would argue that applies to quantitative data too, and big data in terms of what context defined, what variables are included and what variables aren't included. And I think we often kind of forget that piece and grab onto the data and think of it as a concrete representation um, whereas it is, is very much shaped by that context too. Um, and I really appreciate what you were saying, Laura, about just general population and what we need to know from high school and what everybody needs to know about data management. And I think what comes to mind for me is how, you know, within our health system, we're really emphasizing that, you know, these medical electronic health records where, you know, physicians will have access to patient information across institutions, across different situations. Um, but I think the reality is often when we walk into a doctor's office, there's like, how are you doing? You know, what's happened to you and your health over the last 10 years? So our ability to keep that data and those records for ourselves, I think going forward as people in our society will have an important impact on our ability to engage with health systems and other social care systems as well. Oh. Amazing points. Um, one thing I'd like to say in regards to context is that I had a, a prof when I was doing field work as part of my uh, my PhD coursework, who said that you know without context, all you've got is a pile of steaming data, and nobody wants that. So, um, yeah, he was kind of a colorful guy. Anyway. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time. So I think there's one question here, uh, and this is actually from Jeff. Um, on the question of culture change, what do you, and this, again, this is open to anyone, what do you think would help increase the, val the value of data and good data management in the context of tenure and promotion? Considering we are talking about people who may be going on to play the academic game. I think I can answer that briefly and then I'd love other people's thoughts. So 
I think one of the best ways to get that culture change is to actually have a similar approach to what we've been trying to do to have culture change with respect to just collegiality <laughs> or kindness. So the idea is actually have focus groups that are informal where people have like literally PIs and undergrads and grad students and postdocs and community partners and you know government all sit down together in an informal tea chat, fireside tea chat that you know maybe you get a DoorDash if it's still the pandemic, but you're actually able to sit down and say like, what are some of your like, what keeps you up at night around data? And literally sit down and talk to people and then think about how is the tenure process not rewarding some of these, oh my goodness, I'm not sleeping at night. Like it's like publish, 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 but it's like if your publications have errors in it, then that's not really helping the enterprise. So it's like, how do we have, a lot of people are starting to put stuff on GitHub. Maybe that can be a small thing like service. Maybe it could be its own thing. So there's a lot of push towards these areas. And I think they are going, it's just, where would it fit? Would it fit under publication? Would it fit under more service? Would it fit under, you know, I don't know. So I think it'd be good to have a discussion with all levels of the ecosystem and say, look, like this is like, I feel so much empathy for a friend of mine. She's like, I do all this stuff. She's a computer nerd and I don't get any credit for it. I'm like fixing people's code. I'm all over the R like help groups. And you know, I'm doing it cause I care, but like, it really seems kind of unfair. I was like, this seems super unfair. So I'm happy to talk about it wherever I can. And so here I am that small sample, please, please don't disregard all these grad students or postdocs that are doing all this coding and they're getting nothing, nothing <laughs> for it really compared to people that are doing other things. So I think like we give a lot of money people doing lab work or you know, working in an office, why about these people running around doing computer coding? So I think my answer to the question related to tenure is have conversations with the entire ecosystem, including people that aren't even in the tenure process and ask, find the holes. Yeah. I would also, I, I, I love what Joel has been talking about with embedding information professionals in into those groups. And if you take what Joel is saying about embedding the information professionals and you take what Laura is talking about with having conversations up and down and both length and breadth of the ecosystem, and then you combine that also with what Faye's talking about, about interrogating those different ways and where you're coming from with in questioning those contexts. And just if, if you jump in and, and, and like mash all of those things together. Um, this isn't an exact answer to your question about how to, uh, how that works in a tenure process, but I think at the very least, having all of those things mashed together does a lot of what Laura's talking about and, and helps maybe you sleep better at night, helps you achieve more of a, a whole person aspect to your life and your your data management self and being a whole person as opposed to a fragmented person is so much better and uh, yeah i'm just advocating for uh health on the tenure track and even and cuz i'm not going for tenure cuz i'm not a crazy person in that way but um i hear tell that it's you know it's insane. And I just, if we can make it a healthier process, that would be beautiful. Uh, I'll just echo what Aaron said a bit in that I'm not a tenure person, I'm a mid career PhD person who never thought much about getting tenure. But I think that one of the challenges is something that Faye spoke to in a sec uh, few minutes ago, which is data isn't data for everyone. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of acknowledgement now that a lot of humanitarian or humanitarian humanities researchers don't see their data as data because that's not the culture there. Whereas if you go to the other end of the spectrum, people who are dealing, say, uh, an astronomer who's dealing with a very large data set sees it as data in a very different way. And how can you get tenure committees to understand that data isn't a singular, it's a multiple? And the nature of the data, like sharing qualitative data, sometimes you just can't do it. Sometimes you can only do it in a, in a particular way. How do you recognize the complexities of data more broadly?
That is a big question. And I think we're going to have to leave it there for today because we are coming up to the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank all of our panelists today, Faye Strohshine, Joel Minion, Laura Super, Aaron Brown, Matthew Lucas, Jeff Moon, my boss. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you all so much. And uh, and now I'll turn it over to Ian to uh, let you all know what's happening for the rest of the week. Yes, well, thank you, Jen. You did an, an excellent job uh, moderating that discussion and we are coming in perfectly on time. Uh, so thanks for that. And yes, I think we've definitely explored a lot of territory here and hopefully the, the conversations will continue outside of this event um, through either email or maybe uh, through different working groups. Um, I know Laura has quite a few projects uh, that she's happy to share with folks. So uh, we've already had a, a close look at a few of them, which is kind of exciting. I would like to mention that uh, this recording will be available uh, in about two weeks after this. So please feel free to share that with your colleagues who weren't able to make it today. And there are two webinars tomorrow that I want to, to bring to your attention. Adapting methodologies during the pandemic using digital and arts informed research at, in the PhD dissertation. Uh, and the second episode of the good and the bad of black grad on recruit, retain and represent, both of which are gonna be uh, pretty exciting. So uh, thank you to everyone who spoke today. And again, to, uh, to Jennifer for doing a great job moderating and uh, hope to see you folks soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Great job, guys. Oh, kitty. <laughs> Thanks, Ian, for all the coordination. It was great to participate oh, today. Really, fantastic. really interesting discussion with everyone. It was. It was Thanks for coordinating. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I mean, different different folks from all different places and uh, different kind of career statuses. So that was a that was a great panel. Really enjoyed the yeah. conversation there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any demographics on who was attending? Because I was like, oh, wow, it went up pretty high to start with. I was like, yeah. there's like 50 or 60 people. Yeah, well, actually, this webinar had the highest registration of any event this week. Um, oh, wow. It was over 100, I think 115. Um, so, and we usually get about 60 to 70% attendance, but it's it's the end of the year. We've noticed our numbers are a bit down right now. So I think people are just drained. Um, so we will see uh, probably a lot of views after the fact. Um, and we'll keep, keep an eye on those. We do get some data. Um, produced by zoom after this and i can share that with you if you're interested it lets you know who came where they're from how long they stayed uh that type of thing yeah it was really cool because i do think that at the very start there were about 60 or so people yeah. which is like oh wow and then yeah, exactly. you know it's a two-hour thing and people might have you know they might have to do exam marking you know you never know what it is it did, it did time, drop right? at, the, at the end of the first hour so a lot of people blocked yeah time in, in hour long um, blocks. But uh, I think what we noticed at our last symposia that uh, about two thirds of our audience actually watched it after the event. Um, and it gets shared, you know, pretty wide and far uh, through the website on YouTube. So we'll, we'll let you guys know how it does. But congrats. Great, Great job. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good Thanks to so meet much you, Laura. All the best. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care.